Did you, do you guys know that a word from God can change everything? Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. This is what I need you to say then. Say, Lord, speak. Lord, speak. I, am I am listening. That's it. He's going to talk to you today. Amen. Because you asked him and he wants to talk to you. Let's turn to our scripture first. We're going to read. And I want to give props to um, Pastor Alex. I don't know how he does this Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Guys, my first fear was like, okay, I'm going to preach just, you know, for 10 minutes, and then the rest I'm going to stand there having nothing to say. And then once I looked, you know, through the scripture, there's so much. The Bible is so rich. The Word of God is so rich. The more I looked through it, the more I found more stuff. And then Pastor told me, you have 35 minutes. And I'm like, there's no way I can say everything in 35 minutes, so pray for me. Pray for me. <laughs> so Luke 10, and we are going to go uh, from verse 38. Now it happened as they, went, th as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with, all, with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister left me to serve alone? Therefore, go and tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. But one thing, everybody say one. one. Say one thing. One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Say one thing. One thing. It's very important. We're going to come back to the one thing. So we see the story, and this is how it kind of opens up to us. Jesus is traveling. Jesus is at this point kind of a celebrity. He comes into a town. People hear that he's there, they gather around, they want to hear him preach, they want to see the miracles, maybe they want to eat. Um, they have problems, he is a problem solver, he's a big deal. And so Jesus has fans, Jesus has people who just like him, they're, they're, they're his fans. Then Jesus has haters, right? Just, just Haters who, no matter what he does, no matter what he says, it's bad. And then he has friends. And I'm not even talking about his disciples. Disciples he calls friends later on in the, in the scripture. He has friends. Their names are Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. You also have haters. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, you can never please them. They just, they just hate, they want to hate you. Can't help it. You have fans, people who there's nothing really, you don't really try to, you know, for them to like you. They just like you. They just like, want to hang out with you. They just like you. You don't, we don't choose our haters. We don't choose our fans. But we do choose our friends. The reason I'm saying this, I just want you to understand what kind of position these women held in Jesus' life. They were his friends. He specifically chose them to be his friends. I think he chose them because they were nourishing. While everybody is like, Jesus in town, let's get some, uh, something out of him. These women, they were like, Jesus in, in town, let's serve him. Let's serve him. Let's see how can we ha can help him. He serves everybody else. Let's, let's serve him. So these are not bad women. You know, a lot of times we read through Mary and Martha, and it's like, okay, so the Martha is the bad one, Mary is the good one. No, these are, they're both Jesus' friends. And he visits their house, and if we look at this, Martha was actually the one who prepared a dinner, or who was serving Jesus. It was actually even called Martha's house. Mary just probably lived there. <laughs> and I just want to quickly look through the personalities of these two ladies. Lazarus, we'll get to him later. But these two ladies, they're so different. 
They're so opposite. Do you have in your life somebody who is so different than you are that you just can't stand it? They're, they're driving you crazy. Hence, next Sunday, you gotta be here because we all have, if you're Martha, you have a Mary in your life and you just, oh, hurry up. And if you're Mary, you have a Martha in your life who is always bossing you around and telling you what to do. Right? Right? So Martha's, they are right away, whenever you talk about Mary and Martha, they don't like the story. In fact, when I told Martha in my life that I'm gonna preach on this, he said, ah, I hate that story. <laughs> because Martha's feel attacked, they feel like they're the bad guy in the Bible. And Mary's, they just love that story. They just love it. Sitting by Jesus, just listening to him, just catching every word out of his mouth, just enjoying his presence while Martha is slaving around. They love this story because they are the good ones. Um, Martha's, they show their love through uh, doing, doing things. Do you guys know the five languages of love? So more th most Martha's will have the, the language of love that um, it's actions and maybe gifts. You know, they'll, they'll, they won't tell you they'll love you, they'll give you a gift, they'll do stuff for you. They're action, action, action people. And then Mary's, they show love by being, listening, spending time, saying that you're wonderful, you have great shoes on. I noticed that so they love the relationships versus Martha's, they love the doings, the, the deeds, the action. Actions speak louder than, <laughs> there you go, right there. <laughs> Actions speak louder than words. Martha's worry about responsibilities. Mary's worry about relationships. Martha's just can't sit still. Yep. They have an endless to-do list. Yep. This is Martha sitting down with her family to watch a movie. Oh, I forgot to put laundry in, hold on. Okay, oh, okay guys, guys, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm back, okay. Okay, okay, let's watch the movie. Oh my goodness, there's smudges all over that TV. Let me wipe it off. Let me Okay, okay, fine. Oh, I forgot to answer that email. Guys, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna answer the email quick. And then, and then I promise, we'll watch. <laughs> this is like by the end of the movie. <laughs> Never got off her phone. You know why? Because the world needs Martha. Yep. The world <laughs> won't survive without Martha. Martha carries the weight of the world in her shoulders. If she doesn't pick up the phone, it's the end of the world. The, one, the world as we know it will end. Mary doesn't know where her phone is. <laughs> it's buried somewhere. <laughs> she didn't charge it, right? It's buried somewhere underneath the cushions, under, under the table, under the desk. The dog is playing with it. I don't know. Stop elbowing your spouse, okay? Don't do that. You're not helping me when you do that, okay? So just listen, don't flinch when I'm talking about them. Just be like, yes, hey man. <laughs> so Martha is usually the boss, or like usually she, they, Martha people could be bossy. And then Mary people don't like when people boss them around. We don't, they don't, we, we don't like boxes. We don't like pe tell people telling us what to do. We don't like pushy people. You can tell us what to do, but nicely. But Martha's usually are not nice about it. They don't have time to be nice. You know, come on, let's go. <laughs> Martha's don't take vacations because, well, the world is gonna end, right? If she's gonna leave, if they're gonna leave on vacation, the world is gonna end and no, you can't, you can't have that. And if they do go on vacations, they're usually the people who are sitting you know, by the pool on their phones or with their computers or in their rooms on their computers. So the world doesn't end. And then Mary's don't go on vacations because they don't have any money. To go, <laughs> to go on vacations. <laughs> you know, if you ask Martha, every time I'm talking to Martha's, every time I'll hear something like this. Well, if Martha doesn't cook, Jesus doesn't eat, okay? Right. See, right there? <laughs> and, Ma and Mary is like, you know what? Jesus can take two fish, five bread, and make a feed a stadium with it, okay? <laughs> right? 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 right yeah. But no, Martha is gonna feed Jesus. 
Mary is more like, well, let's not do anything. Let's see God come through and produce a miracle. <laughs> Frozen would be a, a, a wonderful example of um, Martha and Mary. So Elsa would be our Martha. And then, you know, um, Mary would be Anna. Do you want to build a snowman? Or ride our bikes around the hall? No, we can't ride bikes around the house, okay? Bikes are not allowed in the house. <laughs> la, 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 life is good for Mary. And for Martha, everything is a struggle. If, if Mary had a song, it would be something like, I got pockets full of, full of sunshine, something, something, na, na, na. <laughs> And, and Martha doesn't have a song. She doesn't have time for songs. She, <laughs> that's too silly, okay? Why am, I, why am I saying all of this? I just want you to, to, to know that um, Martha and Mary are, are bo both wonderful women of God. They were God's friends. And you are wonderful, fearfully and wonder wonderfully made. And the person sitting next to you is wonderful also. And so today, just embrace them just receive them the way they are the controlling the bossy or the free spirit not a care in the world let's sit and talk and drink coffee and tea or diet coke or whatever embrace them life is going to be so much easier if you can learn to love martha or mary So if Jesus is not talking about personalities in this story, what is he talking about? He's talking about you and me. He's talking about you and me. I can be such a Martha sometimes. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can be such a Martha. <laughs> we all can observe Martha moments in our life. And I wrote six observations that I, that I observed in this story, and I thought, oh, that's so me. I'm such a Martha. And we'll go from verse 38. Now it happened, as they went, that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Martha received Jesus into her house. She said, Jesus, come in. But after that, she just failed to spend time with him. She received him. She told him, sit down, Jesus, get comfortable. I got to go. I got to go serve you. I got to go do stuff. I'm too busy for you. You're an honored guest in my house. I've been waiting. I've been cleaning like a maniac the whole time. And now you just sit down and just sit here while I'll be over there do, being busy, saving the world. Do we do that? Yeah. All of you here, I believe you guys are all at the point where you have received Jesus. He is in your heart. He is in your heart. His life is in your heart. But then we just get so busy. We say, Jesus, thank you so much. I'm safe now. I have my insurance. Talk to you later if, when I'm not busy, which is never. <laughs> or, or, hey, Jesus. Okay, you got two minutes? Oh, you have an hour? No, 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 I only have two minutes. Okay, you got your, got your notebook? Okay, write down. This is what I need from you. This is what I need, this is what I need, this is what I need. Nice chat, Jesus, bye. Hun, I, don't go. I, I'm, can, can we spend some time together? Can we sit a little bit together? Oh, no, oh, no, I'm, I'm too busy. So one day, one day when kids are out of the house, when the house, I have a maid and the house is clean, when the business can run itself, when my job is, I don't have to worry about it. One day I'll have a lot of time and I'll spend time with you, but just not today. Not today, Jesus, I can't. Verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Okay. I will talk to you a little bit about culture today, so please don't get offended. Open your heart, God wants to speak to you. What we're observing in the scripture over here, and, and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. This was very culturally abnormal. 
This is not okay. This picture right here is not okay. There's a reason Martha got upset about this. Because number one, women were not allowed, and it was not a custom, for women to sit around while men are talking, and women are sitting and talking with them. Oh, no, 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 no. Your place is in the kitchen. Your place is in the laundry room. You're, you have to be serving. Let the man do the important talking, and, and you go and serve them. That was the culture. And, and everybody did that. You know how we've, we're followers of our culture? We're such sheep. I mean, I'm sorry, Bible calls us sheep because we are sheep. Have you guys seen those videos going around on Facebook where people um, are doing something that they don't even know why? Did you see that video where everybody in the room knew what's going on, but the one, only one person didn't know? And they were all sitting in a waiting room in, like, I think, some kind of a doctor area, and there was a beep. You know, when the beep would go on or a sound would go on, everybody would get up. Everybody was on it except one lady. Everybody would just get up randomly. And she, first time she looked at everybody, second time she kind of did like half a, I mean, this is randomly. Nobody's telling them to, to get up. It's just a sound, beep, and they all just get up. And the third time she full, she, she just stood up and she was standing there. And for the next, I don't know how long the experiment was, but we just see it. The sound go off, everybody stands up, she stands up. She has no idea why she's doing it. Then later on, those people, one by one, they leave. She's left alone in the room. Beep. <laughs> Beep. She doesn't know why she's doing it, but because everybody around her did it, we must, be, we must need to be doing that. Yeah. So then new people came in who are not on, uh, they don't know what's going on. They came in, they sat down. Beep. She gets up, the guy looks at her once, looks at her twice, then he asks, why are you getting up? And she says, I don't know, everybody was getting up, I thought that's what we need to do. Next time, beep, the guy who is not in on it is getting up with her. <laughs> and here we have another, like, the room is again full of people who are not in on the experiment, and they're all getting up at the sound of beep for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> we are such sheep. We could be saying, we could be seeing that this is white. I, I know it's white, but just because everybody's saying this is black, I don't want to stand out. I'm just going to go along with everybody, but not Jesus. Aren't you glad that Jesus is not just like any other person? Yeah. And that's why you can't trust him. You can't follow him because he's not going to abandon you because the culture abandoned you. He's not going to abandon you because your family abandoned, because you disappointed your family. He's not going to abandon you because he doesn't care to stand out out of the crowd. That's what he does. Yeah. And so we see Jesus saying, no, Mary, your, your place is with me. Your place is with my revelation. You don't have to be in the kitchen. Just because the culture says, I want you close to me. I want you with me. Number, number two, to sit at a rabbi's or a teacher's feet was equivalent of... Um, People didn't apply into a college. They would apply to a rabbi. They would come and say, can I please you, you know, learn from you? Can I be your student? And then the, the teacher or rabbi would think, and he would you know, uh, determine if the person is qualified, and he would say, okay, you can sit at my feet. And here we see in verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Also means not that... Martha was sitting as a disciple also means that she was one of the disciples chosen by Jesus to sit and be equipped for ministry, for serving in God's kingdom by Jesus himself. Amen. Unheard of. Unheard of. And sometimes I found that God calls me to do these things and to believe these things and to uphold these things that are not culturally co correct. They're not. A lot of things in the Bible, we just, well, you know, maybe that back then that used to work, but not anymore. Well, back then, they treated women like garbage. They treated women like servants, women and children, women and children. And so sometimes people will, I'll hear people say that, well, Bible is against women, Bible putting women down. 
No, the cu that culture. And culture is created by the spirit of this world, not by God. But God comes in, Jesus comes in, and he redefines the culture. He says, I don't care about culture. Come sit with me, Mary. I love you. You are my child. Feminists will tell you that we give women voice, and Bible puts women down. No, Jesus gives us voice. We don't have to go and stand and, and, pro and protest and stand topless. We don't have to get our voice that way. You know, I, you might be asking a question, and Pastor Alex gave me this, so I'm not going to take credit for it, but I thought it was just mind-blowing what he said. Why can't just Jesus just break the culture? Just say, from now on, thou shall not have women in the kitchen. Or, you know, I mean, why couldn't he just do that? And this is what Pastor Alex told me. He said, Jesus is not going to change the culture. He's going to change your heart, and then you are going to go and change the culture. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He's going to change your heart, and then he's going to change our heart, and we are going to go and influence our culture. Amen. So protesting is not going to do anything. Inviting people to church, telling people about Jesus will change our culture, and we need Amen. Jesus Amen. in our culture. Woo! Verse number 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Oh, I could be such a Martha. I could be such a Martha. The other day I um, heard a story about a young, young woman that I know, and she was going through ho horrible things in her marriage. And I had this flashback as I was listening to what she was going through. I had a flashback to couple, like a month ago when I had a chance, I saw her. And I, I know she wanted to talk to me. I sighed in her, the way she stopped and, and she was like, hi, you can tell when a person wants to talk to you, right? They're trying to take your time. But you know what, I was busy. I was busy, I was doing something very important. I'm sure I was shopping for groceries or something like that, you know? It needed to get done, nobody's gonna do it. I'm the only one in my family. I'm so upset. Nobody's helping me ever. This is horrible. My life is bad because I'm, not, I'm the only one who is serving. I'm the only one who is doing anything in this house. <laughs> I'm so tired. Nobody even says thank you ever. Never. No matter how hard I work, they never say thank you. Look at them having a good time over there watching TV, playing ball, playing together while I'm slaving. <laughs> Jesus, can't you do something? And then, you know, my son comes over to me. He's like, Mom, don't have time for you. You know, I'm, I'm working. I'm working here. Nobody appreciates it. <laughs> and my daughter comes up to me, and she was like, Mom, you know, something happened in school. Well, good. Good for you that bad things happen to you. At least something else, somebody else is suffering as much as I'm suffering. <laughs> you know, because we're, we're so focused on the detail, on unimportant details of serving that nobody even needs and wants that serving anymore. Eat, I said, I cooked it for you. Eat it. I can be such a Martha sometimes. I can pass by people's pain because I'm busy, I'm serving God. I'm too busy to talk to you, Jesus. I'm getting a message ready. Do you understand the pressure of preaching to people at New Life? I don't have time to talk to you right now. I don't have time to pray and listen to your word because I have to preach the Bible to people. Okay, Jesus? I'm busy. You guys are laughing, but that's what we do. Yeah. That's what we do. We all have that. Well, maybe not you because you guys are amazing. But, you know, you will sit down and you open your Bible and you, f you read a verse and you feel there's more to it. There's more to it. You should, I should stop wait a minute, and um, let God speak to me. But I don't have time. So I'm, maybe I'm going to do that at night. I'm just going to read it for now, and I'm going to meditate on it the whole day. And then at night, I'm going to come back to the verse, and Jesus, we can talk. And then at night, as I'm falling asleep and thinking of my list, tomorrow, Jesus, tomorrow morning, I'll wake up extra early, and we will talk. We will talk. I'm just too busy. They didn't even finish my list. And then guess what? You wake up in the morning, your list is full again. Your list is back up full, 
and we go at it. We can be such a Martha, worrying about serving Jesus but not spending time with Jesus. Relationship over serving. Let me ask you, ladies, if your husband was um, bringing home the money, I mean, he was bringing home the bacon, and you were buying stuff, and you, you know, like, literally, you were financially, you were real good, he was working hard, and, and you could not complain financially, but then he would say, well, honey, I can't talk to you, you know that, I'm, I work hard for a family, right? You understand that? I, I work hard, I can't talk to you. How many of you ladies would be happy in a marriage like that? Yes, I, the money is good. Hun, the money is good. I'm not complaining about the money. But can we sit down? Can we have, can you listen to what I have to say? Can you tell me what's in your heart? The money is good. I'm not, you know, don't, don't abandon the, the, the things. Don't abandon the details. But there is just one thing that if, we, if you don't have in your marriage, the money won't matter, right? Am I right? Yeah. I know I'm right. <laughs> Maybe for guys it's a little bit different, but I know for us ladies, we need that one thing. And then bring the, home the money. Yes, please do. Please do. <laughs> and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Lord, do you not care have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Lord, hello, do you not care? You really don't care. I know you guys have prayed a prayer like that. Maybe you didn't word it like that, but we all have felt like that in our life. Hello, are anybody there? Am I all alone in all of this? All this mess that's going on, am I all alone? Hello, do you even care? You felt like that. You know how this feels, right? You know where she's coming from. She has guests okay, what do you feed God, okay? <laughs> I mean, what do you feed? Th that's a pressure. She has God over for dinner. She's the only one who is serving. Everybody else is just reclining and enjoying themselves. She is in over her head. What if Jesus gets poisoned and dies? I don't know. You know? I mean, you have to be extra careful. You have to be... You can't kill God. It's not going to look good on your resume. <laughs> she has a lot of pressure. Lord, do you care? Are you there? Are you listening? Are you part of my life? Therefore, tell her to help me. When we fall into self-pity, we start blaming God. We start blaming God for our own mess-ups. Remember Adam when he messed up in the heel? He messed up. He messed up for all of us. I still want to get him. But then I feel like if it wasn't Adam, it would have been me. So somebody, one of us would have eaten that apple. Do you, do you remember what he told God? He said, God said, ask them, did you eat of the, of the tree that I told you not to eat? And what did he say? Yes, Lord, I'm so sorry. I take all the responsibility. I have, I've been a bad boy. <laughs> No, no. What does he say? It's your fault. You know why? Because the woman that you gave me, the wo it wasn't. If you didn't have that surgery, you know that one day when I woke up without a rib, <laughs> we wouldn't be in this mess. It's your fault, God. It's somebody else's fault. A few months later. We see Martha with the, same, with the same kind of attitude when Lazarus, her brother, got very, very sick. And they called for Jesus because they're very good friends. They know that Jesus is the Son of God. He can do something about it. They said, Jesus, come. Our, our brother is dying. Jesus, for reasons that only Jesus knows, did not show up, showed up too late. And when he shows up, Martha hears about it, that he's walking toward her. She gets up. <sighs> let, me, let me tell you, Jesus, let me tell you something. If, it, if, you, if you were here, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. God, if you were there in that situation, you, would, you could have prevented it. You could have protected me, God. Come on. Come on, Jesus. You, could have, you could have stood up for me. 
You could have killed them right there, the, the people who are making me miserable. We can see Martha's attitude. And so I could be such a Martha sometimes. I could have Martha's heart. I, I can have a heart of blaming. It kind of, it's kind of a proud heart maybe also. It's a heart of, it's not a humble heart. Mar Martha is not a personality. It's hearts, my heart's posture. It's a posture of Adam. It's a posture of blame, rebuke, self-righteousness, fairness. It's not fair. Mary is a heart of humility and surrender. Sitting by somebody's stinky feet and learning from them. Learning is humility, guys. Learning is, that's why the, the older we get, we get prouder and prouder and it gets harder for us to learn because we already know everything, especially for Martha. We know it all. Surrender Jesus in the garden, saying, I don't want this, God. I don't want this. I would rather not go through this. But if this is your will, then bring it on. Mary cries in surrender and humility at his feet. So when we see later on when her brother, her brother, Mary's brother died just like Martha's brother died. I mean, they were sisters, so their brother died. We see that they're sitting in a house. Martha hears that Jesus is coming. She gets up. She stumps off to tell Jesus that he was bad. Nobody gets up at that point because, because when Martha gets up, nobody really cares because Martha is always, right? She's up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So nobody cares that Martha got up because she's always pins and needles. She's always panicking. She's always reacting. But then we see Mary, a different posture, a posture of surrender, a humble heart. She's sitting there and, and, me, and Martha comes, Jesus didn't listen to me. What should I do? Let me, let me get his favorite girl. So <laughs> she comes to Mary and she says, Mary, Jesus is calling you. Mary's like, Jesus is calling me. She gets up. All the people who were around her, Mary's up. Mary's up. Something is up. Let's go follow her. Because see, Mary is, is stable. Her spirit is stable. And when Mary gets up, everybody gets up. Because Mary doesn't jump to conclusions. She doesn't, she's not panicking. But when Mary gets up, people around Mary are like, something is going on. Let's go. So Mary is walking. She's running to Jesus. Guess who is running behind her to Jesus? All these people are running behind Mary to see Jesus. They don't even know it yet. They don't know. When you have Mary's heart, you live your life. People are watching you. They're following you. They don't even know yet that they're following to see Jesus. But they're following you because there's something about you. There's this stability. There's this peace. There's this humility. Especially, especially in troubles and problems of our life. And so she runs to Jesus. She says practically the same phrase. But she says it. She says it at his feet. She's, I'm not going to fall here because it's not going to look good, but she is falling at his feet. And she's like, Jesus, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. But she doesn't say it with his finger. Yeah. She says, that, Jesus, only you can help us. You're my only hope. It's all in your hands. I can't help myself. I can't do nothing here. It's you. It's all up to you now. When you're in, in problem, when you're in a hard situation, you can, and a lot of times, guys, we start as Martha. And we look in, in Psalms, David started sometimes, Lord, oh Lord, why have you forsaken me? And, and or, everything is horrible and my enemies are against me. And so, you know, like I said before, they're both, both women were Jesus' friends. They were, one was not evil over the other one. They were both his friends. You are a friend of God. And so maybe your prayer is going to start as, why, why, don't you care? Do you care? Are you there? As long as you finish on your knees, and as long as you say, without you, I am nothing. I can't do nothing. I can't control anything. I'm so done controlling everything. I'm done. 
where everything I control falls apart. Martha is our natural response to problems. It's just natural for people to panic. It's natural. Mary is life by faith. And people follow life by faith. Nobody follows the natural, the everybody. You panic, I panic, we all panic. But when I see somebody who is in trouble, who is some, in deep waters, in, in pressure, when their brother is dead, it's hopeless situation, I watch people who are strong in faith. I watch people who are stable. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. This is very important because in the beginning when I read this, I kind of said, Martha, Martha. But that's not how Jesus said it. This, if we go, if we go into original language, this sounds like he's almost grabbing her face and he's pulling her close and he's saying, Martha, Martha. He's not saying, how dare you? Do you know I'm God and you're not? I can like, psh, you know, and you're not here. <laughs> you were never here. No, he's pulling her close. And when he says that, he says, I see you. I see you. I, I feel, I know that, I know the pressure. I know how hard this is for you. I know, I feel your pain, Martha. Come, come close to me, Martha. I know, I know all those worries. I know all those problems. But you only need one thing, and I'm here to give it to you. He's not saying, you lost your chance. He's not saying, it's too late for you. You screwed up. He's like, come. Come, Martha, come, come. I'm going to give you that one thing, that one thing, and that's my last point. Sit with Jesus so you can later stand in the storm. I'm going to give you that one thing. Not that, not that details are not important. Not that working hard is not important. Not that, you know, cooking and, and serving is very important. Thank God for people who, who are like that in our lives. But if we don't spend time at Jesus' feet, we are going to be running around making ourselves miserable, making everybody around us miserable. Or if we spend time at Jesus' feet, we can, we'll be serving late, even later on after Jesus creates a huge miracle, resurrects a dead man, who was already stinky. Six days after that, Mary is serving Jesus. But it's not out of, Jesus, look at me, look at me, I'm serving, I'm doing so much, I'm such a hard worker, look at me, look at me. No. He's sitting, talking with his friends. She quietly comes. She brings one year worth of her wages, perfume. She worked for one year. She bought a perfume. And she pours it all, all of it at Jesus' feet. And she wipes his feet with her hair. You see, when you spend time with Jesus, you will serve. Serving is good. God wants you to serve. But it's going to come out of different heart. You are going to enjoy serving. You're going to love serving. <laughs> spend time with Jesus. Sit with him. You can't afford not to. You can't, uh, guys, I know how this is. I know how we sit down and you right away have all these thoughts, all these demands. We gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Get a word from him, get a word from Jesus and that word can change everything. You know how many times I've talked with people who, pastor, pray for me, pray for me. Tell your husband to pray for me, pray for me. I'm going through stuff. And I'm, I'm, and I'm seeing that there's no stability. She never heard or he never heard from God. And my question is always, what is God telling you? Because I know that whatever I tell you, whatever pastor tells you, whatever you hear somewhere, it's going to go away because somebody else is going to say something else. Situation is going to happen and your mind is going to change. But see, when you get a word from God, when you get a word from God about your family, yes, maybe your marriage is falling apart, but you, get, you, you sit 
And sometimes it's not a, a word, word sentence that you can repeat. It's just this peace. It's just, it's just this peace. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. When somebody says, you know, give up on this already, you're like, nope, nope. I'm holding on. I'm holding on to the Word of God. When somebody says, do you see what's happening with your children? Do you see what's going on? Nope, nope, nope. I'm holding on. God gave me a word. It's going to be okay. He's in charge of my life. It's going to be okay. I can go through this. Get a word from God. It can change everything for you. Not that it's going to change your circumstances. It's going to change everything inside of you to help you hold on and go through storms and come out strong.